We know since the beginning of this integrated rangeland management class that there's only a few tools we have to be really effective on the large landscapes that include rangelands, and those are, of course, grazing and fire, two among the, the most effective. And then we we'll, we talked last week about some of the invasive plant management techniques, including biocontrol. Um, I haven't talked a lot about fire. I'm going to talk a bit about um, not prescribed fire so much as the interaction between grazing and fire. To begin with, um, think about the role that grazing has on fires. There's only a few things that we can do with grazing animals that influence the severity, spread, and intensity of fires. Um, and those all deal with fuel characteristics. So the main things that we can do with grazing is to change composition. Um, fires that grow through, that um, run through woody areas are different than those in herbaceous. So we can manage herbaceous versus woody fuels. The second would be the fuel amount, that's the, the biomass or the, the fuel load. And then finally we can uh, change continuity. So in this presentation I'm going to look at um, the real role that grazing could play on those three factors primarily. Fuel, bi biomass composition, fuel amount, and fuel continuity. Okay, let's start off by just coming to the realization that um, at least those of us in the West realize that gr that wildfires, total wildfires, are increasing this, and that we've had a, an especially rough couple of decades. So I've got some data from the joint, uh, the National Inter Interagency Fire Center here. And what you see is that the, the actual number of fires in the blue bars are going down over time. But what's increasing is the acres of fires. So what you have is fewer or a stabilized number of fires, but they're much bigger. I'm burning, you know, much larger areas with really bad fire years and 2006 and 7 and and last and 2011 also being a uh, a year of, of a lot of large wildfires. So so why is that? What has changed over time? Let's look at some historic patterns that might have contributed to this growing number and size of wildfires. Start by looking way back at um, the role that grazing might play. A lot of people say that the reason we have more fires in the West is because we have less grazing and so there's more fuel on the ground. Well, certainly uh, in the late 1800s, that's when grazing was at that, the peak level for um, grazing on what was at that time the public domain, not even federally managed land. As we started to get management in the 30s to the 50s, that era from um, about the, the Taylor Grazing Act in, in the 30s all the way through the 50s when BLM was organized and started to take shape, we really had a huge reduction in the number of AUMs out on the public domain or the federal lands. From the 50s through now, it's the, the number of AUMs on land is still decreasing due to public pressure, due to increased management, uh, due to endangered species. Um, well, maybe not species so much, but um, different uses and concerns of, on the land. Um, so I'm going to take a little closer look at those sort of modern numbers from 1950 for, forward. Um, so what we see there is just, again, in the, in the mid-50s, the BLM, was a young agency and really starting to get control and starting to write um, permits. So we saw a pretty decrease up to about 1960. And then it's been relatively stable, but also a, a decline in AUMs over time with some decreases, sometimes due to, um, due to the, some of those dips are due to decreased stocking um, just because of uh, livestock conditions or range conditions where people voluntarily graze less animals. So bottom line is, yes, um, number of AUMs, the number of livestock out there grazing on federal lands anyways, is decreasing. And that could contribute to wildland fire, though that increase that we're seeing in the size of fires could be related to increased fuel because we're having less animals on the land. A lot of other trends that are happening, it's not just grazing. Another thing that's happened since the 50s is um, an expansion of annual grasses on rangelands. Now I'm going to focus, focus particularly on the Great Basin here. Um, cheatgrass has been around for a long time. These annual grasses, cheatgrass, medusa head, red brome, were all introduced in the late 1800s, but they didn't really become abundant until the 40s and 50s. And that was when they really started to fuel um, wildland fire cycles. Uh, they are good fuel. They are fine textured flammable, they mature early, and one effect that early maturity has on fires is that it extends the fire year, that the fire season starts earlier because of these annual grasses. 
and so the total fire year is extended. Um, there is some research that also shows those that fine fuels, those annual grasses, um, are great ignition sources, so they do increase the ignition risk. So if wildfire or human caused human sparks and you know start on the range, they're more likely to turn into a fire. Um, it also decreases a fire return interval because they really can recover quickly after fire. We can have fuel very shortly after one fire. It doesn't take long to have another fuel bed to to start the cycle again. So there's a lot of trends going on out there on the range. Certainly livestock numbers are going down, but at the same time human development is increasing. Cheatgrass and other annual grasses is increasing. Uh, we know that the recent fire or weather patterns, longer, hotter, drier summers, especially in the last decade, could be fueling longer, hotter fires. So for all of these reasons, um, fires are increasing. I don't think you can blame it at any one, but co collectively all of these and others are creating situations where we're having larger fires, especially in the Great Basin. So what role could livestock grazing play in all this? Well, that's the question at hand. Um, grazing, the two main roles that I'm going to focus on is the role that we could use grazing to manage fuels, those the fire fuels, um, especially herbaceous plants, and then also look at the role that grazing plays on those invasive plants, especially those invasive annual grasses. Let's first start by looking at the fuel, the fuel loads. Okay, if you've been out in the West, you've seen a lot of these um, fire line or um, fence line contrasts where uh, the fire moves along and stops at a fence. And in this case, um, and in most cases, the fire stopped because there's less fuel on one side of the fence. So here the fire was coming from the left, moving right, and stopped at the fence in when it got to a grazed pasture. Other reasons that you might have fence line contrasts um, are just because vegetation treatments often happen in pastures or along fences. Uh, but certainly this is a case where the grazing made a difference. So grazing affects fire behavior because it can change the perimeter of a fire or, or the actual extent, the size of the fire. It can change the intensity of the fire, how hot it is and how severe it is. Uh, it, it also could, could affect the patchiness. We don't know as much about um, how grazing influences that patchiness of fires, um, but we do know it happens. And then finally, we'll talk about some data that shows that grazing influences flame lengths, and that's very important for those of you who are in the fire world. You know that that's important because um, fire, uh, when when you man when you're trying to manage fire, you know when humans are trying to manage it, fire crews are managing it. It's really important to keep the flow le flame lengths low because once they get um, too high, then there can be no human direct attack on the fire. So managing flame lengths is important. I'll we'll start with this uh, idea of, of extent and um, patchiness. In this slide, we have an area, the blackest area, which was an ungrazed sagebrush step area. Sagebrush is also very good fuel. Those essential oils make it quite flammable, so that's the blackest part of this fire. Then there's a yellow line just to show that extent, and you go into an ungrazed seeding, seeding of a perennial grass. See the fire got a little patchier there, at least it's it, not as black, so not as much was was burned. And then it hits a fence line. And notice what happens, in some cases the fire actually stops along the fence line, but what's more important is that the fire continued across the fence and then just kind of fingered out into the grazed seeded area. So this contrast between the ungrazed and the grazed seeded areas is, is really quite significant. And uh, we don't know how heavy the grazing was in the grazed seeded area, but it is amazing to see that fire just, just finger out. So we do know that grazing can influence extent and patchiness of fires. And that's important because I think we could live with fire if it could be, could be patchy and if we'd always have sort of seed sources that could help in restoration. So let's talk about those fuel loads and how grazing actually influences them. I'm going to show you some data, some data that Kirk Davies and the folks out at Burns um, have created over the years. And this is a pretty simple but pretty straightforward study where um, Kirk, just, Kirk Davies just looked at the effect of grazing on fuel loads and what he was particularly measuring was the accumulation of biomass and litter. And he's looking at the distribution of litter specifically in perennial grass crowns. And um, he found a three-fold in increase in the accumulation of 
of litter, especially the, the dead biomass inside of the plant, and then an increase in the, the depth of litter. So th that's pretty easy to see in this graph. On the top you see a, a healthy grass that's got a lot of dead biomass coming up amongst those green stems, and at the bottom a plant that was grazed probably the previous year, and it has a lot of new stems. These are, look like they're both needle grasses. So in this study that um, Davies published in 2009, I'm just going to focus on a couple of treatments. He did um, some had some grazed and grazed plots that were burned and some that were not burned, and we'll come back to that study. But the but the basis of um, Kirk's work was that there were some livestock exposures that were erected in the 1930s to look at the effects of grazing, and um, he applied he looked at those exposures to see how the accumulation of fuels um, over time. And here's what he found. So if you look at that grazed and non-grazed, so the grazed areas outside the exposures, non-grazed in the exposures, and you see something that's really predictable. The perennial grass, or PG, on this chart was um, twice as much, a little more than, or about twice as much in the non-grazed, inside the exposure. There was more than twice as much perennial grass. A lot of that was stems from previous years in the um, in, in the crown of the plant, you know, standing up with the plant. It also created a situation was the total amount of standing herbaceous biomatter, T H E R B total herb, was greater. And we'll come back to the gaps changing in the site. But one of the things that was interesting in this study is that uh, Kirk Davies and colleagues they they did not measure litter. They did not. They only considered litter as the litter that was actually on the ground. So the difference that we see in the perennial grass and the total herbs was just because there was more standi standing dead fuel right along with the live fuel. Um, now what happened to those areas when the, those they, they were burned? What we find is really no change in Sandberg bluegrass. It's got very short leaves right down to the base. But we did see overall, um, Dr. Davies found that the ungrazed burned plot had less biomass production after the fire than, than before. Okay, so the, the ungrazed, the hashed bars, are the exposure. So he measured vegetation before, there a fire came through, and after the fire there was more grass, more perennial grass in the grazed area outside the exposure than in the area inside the exposure. Think about why that might be. You would think, I mean it would be argued that Inside the exposure, there was no grazing, so the plants should have been really healthy because they didn't have to respond to grazing. And yet, when a fire goes through, there's less recovery inside the exposure. And Dr. Davies' explanation of that is that there was more fuel, and the fire came through, and it probably was more intense. He wasn't able to measure fire intensity, uh, but but it could be that there was more fuel. The fire was hotter, killed some root crowns, and actually killed some plants. Dr. Davies is following up to try to see what the actual mechanism is, but that's his hypothesis, is that the fuel inside the exposure was so great that the perennial grasses were damaged. And, but the, probably the most interesting thing and, and un, um, you know, something that wasn't expected, the unexpected result, is look at the difference in cheatgrass in the middle of this, of this graph. Again, you'd think outside in the grazed area there'd be more disturbance and the plants would not be as healthy, so they would, when the fire came through, more cheatgrass would come in, but the ex exact opposite happened. When the perennial grass was damaged, the thing that seemed to take the advantage of that was cheatgrass. So you have, uh, you, know, t you know, four times more cheatgrass inside the exposure, inside the area that was ungrazed, than outside where it was grazed. Perennial forbs are also different different. Uh, there was um, more recovery of forbs in the grazed area outside and annual forbs. There was more annual forbs inside the exposure. The graphs are great, but look at this. This is um, some pictures that show the differences. On the left, that's the area that was outside the exposure 15 years um, post-fire, and then there's the area that was grazed and burned. And on the right hand side, the, the un, I'm sorry, on the right hand side is the ungraze, the exposure. So the results are that there was substantial cheatgrass invasion following a fire inside the exposures in the ungrazed area. There was less perennial grass in exposures post burning than there was in the moderately grazed area. And then when he looked at the unburned conditions,
the unburned area inside the exclosure and the unburned moderately grazed treatments were roughly the same except for that standing dead biomass. So where to go from there? It's, it would be really nice to know uh, what the effect that grazing has and be able to set up grazing treatments and then uh, run fires through the range, but people are pretty intolerant of research that involves setting large fires. So a lot of the data that we have on the role of uh, grazing on fire is through fire models. I'm going to show you some data that was created by Dr. Bunting, Steve Bunting, using the Fire Plus um, fire modeling system. Which he so what he did in this with this fire model is he simulated grazing and then he looked at the fire behavior effects by by incrementally reducing the the fuel loading effect, the, the herbaceous fuel load, and then also the fuel moisture. And what he found is that when fuel moisture is pretty low, so this is 10% dead fuel moisture, that's pretty low, uh, the fire was per, went, went um, quickly grew and, and the surface rate of spread grew quickly, even with very low biomass, so the um, x-axis is live herbaceous biomass. And on the range, 200 pounds per acre would be pretty small, thinking about blue bunch wheatgrass rangeland as being about 600 pounds per acre. So the fire started, and it quickly spread, very quick rate of spread, and then also the fire line intensity, the heat at the fire was very high early on, right away at 200 um, pounds per acre. The fire got hot, and it spread quickly. And then the, the different lines on this are uh, wind speeds 5, 10, 15, and greater than 15 miles per hour. So bottom line is you would have to reduce fuel loads to well below 200 to have effect on fires that are going through the system at really low dead fuel moistures or in conditions that are windy. So in this case, um, fire grazing probably would not be effective in reducing fire spread. However, if you, would, if you increase the dead fuel moisture to 12% under those same conditions, you see that now the fire doesn't start to respond and really spread across the landscape and really have high fire line intensity until somewhere past 400 kilograms. So you have opportunities at fuel loads between 400 and 600 pounds per acre or kilograms per hectare, roughly the same. So now when you start to talking about reducing areas of range that generally only produce seven or eight hundred pounds per acre and trying to reduce them to levels of five or six hundred pounds per acre as a way to slow um, fires. Now we have options in grazing management. So bottom line, at higher fuel moistures and at lower wind speeds, grazing could be effective in reducing the spread of wildfires and the fire line intensity. Um, a couple of other graphs that just show um, the effect of fuel moisture. And what's particularly important here is a graph, the, in this graph, the right hand side of these graphs shows um, where Dr. Bunting modeled a carryover of fuels by 50%. So on the left hand side is an area that was not grazed the year before the fire, and on the right hand side is an area that was grazed. So even under the same conditions, the top two graphs and the bottom two graphs, even under those conditions, when you um, graze a pasture, it can affect the, the fire. It can affect the fuel and the fire in the following year. So that's an important point. We didn't actually know that much before. It makes a lot of sense. So that grazing is important during the year of fire, but even grazing the previous year could influence the fire. This was an interesting study that was done in Hawaii, and uh, they were using grazing to reduce fire um, conditions. And what they have here is they were looking at the rate of spread and the flame length. So rate of spread on the a charts A and B and the flame length in C and D. And what they have here is conditions where uh, they had uh, wind speeds of low. The left two bars are low wind speeds and high wind speeds. So again, the point that at high wind speeds it's hard to use grazing to manage fire. Uh, but at low wind speeds, uh, grazing can actually be used to reduce fuel loads and reduce the, f the size of the fire and the flame length. So I think I've, we've shown graphs that show that time and time again. Reduced um, fire line intensity, flame length of spread can only really be accomplished with grazing at relatively low wind speeds and relatively high dead fuel moistures.
Another thing that we've learned over the years uh, has to do with how uh, fire spreads in annual grasses. This was a study by Diamond, Call, and DeVoe in um, 2009, and it was often believed that cheatgrass was just a, a fuel that was so good that grazing would not have an effect. So these researchers did a late fall burn, and they had an area that was grazed and burned, and then an area that was not grazed. So the dark bars are the area that was not. Take a look at the yellow, uh, I'm sorry, at the zero bar. That's the distance inside the treatment, and the treatment in this case was grazing. So before, so they started a fire 10 meters before the area that was grazed, the fence line essentially. The fire started to build, and when it hit the fence line, it was the same the same flame length whether it was going into a grazed area or an ungrazed area. But what happened right away, as soon as the fire got to the fence line, in cheatgrass again, the fire line, the, the flame length went way down in the grazed area, and whereas it continued to grow in the ungrazed area. So 5, 15, 35, 55, by the time it got into the treatment, the fire did go out. Okay, so it shows that you can use grazing to reduce fuel spread and to reduce fire spread in cheatgrass. Um, the unwritten part of this is that it did require pretty heavy 80% utilization uh, of these fuels in order to accomplish this. But it shows that grazing could be used to create fire lines, to reduce you know, the spread of fire, to create situations where there is so little biomass that the fire would stop. So let's go back to our effects of grazing on fire in the sagebrush step. We talked about the fuel load now let's talk about the continuity. We don't know a lot about continuity, but um, we do know that grazing could increase uh, or could decrease fuel continuity in a couple of ways. This is going back to that those data by Dr. Davies where he had the grazed and ungrazed exclosures. And what he found was in the non-grazed area, so in the area inside the exclosure, there was less of a gap between plants than in the grazed area. So that's the second bars there. And the first bar shows there was more grass in the non-grazed area, and that, and then it was there was less of a, a gap between grasses. So this is just a few centimeters. Look at the right-hand chart there; it's just a few centimeters of gap. Is that effective or not to stop or slow fire? Well, it probably depends on the wind and the fuel moisture, but it does show that grazing can increase the gap between plants. We also know uh, people that work with livestock know that when livestock go out on shrub, you know, shrub step on areas that have shrubs, they focus first on the grasses that are between the shrubs, and that's another way that we might increase um, the gaps between plants and decrease fuel continuity. This research was done again at um, Burns, Oregon, by France et al., and what they found was just what most ranchers are always knew that um, as the Fire as the grazing pressure increases, so they did that by starting putting some cows in a small pasture and measuring the vegetation every two days, two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, all the way on the up to eighteen on the x-axis. And then they looked at the percent of perennial plants that were grazed, and in between the plants, the plants were first grazed right away, and by day, oh. For six, they'd reach that 50% mark where you'd think that maybe they should be removed, cows should be removed from that pasture. But look at the number, the utilization of shrubs under the canopy. Uh, that was just uh, 10%. So it shows that animals really quickly focused on the plants between the shrubs. But that continued on. And so it wasn't until uh, the plants be under the canopy, I'm sorry, the plants between the canopy were grazed to almost 80% before we started to see a real strong increase in the utilization of plants under the canopy. So bottom line, animals do focus their energy, grazing animals focus their energy on plants between the shrubs in this case. That could increase the distance between uh, fuel loads and, in, and uh, decrease fuel continuity. <coughs> So now we've talked about grazing and how it affects fire fuel loads. Um, let's talk also about how livestock grazing can affect annual grasses, especially how grazing can affect invasive plants. And let's keep our eye on those invasive annual grasses because those are the ones that we talked about as being good fuel loads and, and we've talked previously about how grazing can be used to manage those. So let's focus on invasive plants, specifically invasive annual plants. Okay, annual grasses.
can be influenced by grazing. Grazing promote annual grasses because they uh, grazing creates a disturbance and it focuses on perennial grasses reducing that um, the, pr the competitive uh, pressure on annual grasses. Um, but we do what we know that grazing does not stop invasion. Uh, it would be nice if we could just walk away and remove all the grazing and you'd never have cheap grass, but that isn't the case. Uh, there's quite a few good anecdotal st stories about areas that were never grazed, such as Kerry Kapuka, which is in the, a big a land area that is surrounded by lava, so great that livestock probably never got to the Kapuka. Um, there is some evidence there might have been some early sheep grazing on the Kapuka, on Kerry Kapuka, but it was never extensive. There's also an island in the middle of Lake Pyramid in Nevada that um, never had grazing on it. There's uh, a big um, Butte that I've been at in called King's Crown in central Idaho and all of those places once you get there it's quite a journey to get there but once you get there there's cheatgrass so not grazing something is an, an area of land is not going to stop invasion. We also know from uh, last week's discussion that grazing can suppress annual grasses. So can grazing be used to change the abundance of annual grasses? Yes and no. It depends on the season of grazing and the level of avo available moisture. Uh, this graph I showed uh, in the um, invasive plant uh, targeted grazing to reduce invasive plants lecture, but again what we know about sheep grass is that we can use grazing, in this case they use sheep, to reduce the abundance or pounds per acre of cheek grass. Um, but what, if you remove grazing, uh, the cheek grass can really respond quickly. So the key is you have to keep grazing on an area for long enough to kill the seeds, and in the case of cheatgrass, that's probably five or six years. The study was too short to actually stop the cheatgrass, um, and once they removed grazing, uh, cheatgrass came right back. This study I haven't showed before. It's an interesting one. It was done in uh, an eight-year grazing study done in northern Arizona. It was in sagebrush steppe, but it's a little different country than we have here in Idaho. It's just at the very edge of the Great Basin. And um, what they had did in here is they had three grazing treatments, uh, no grazing or the cattle removed removal treatment, the green bars, or moderate grazing, the yellow bars, or high impact grazing, which is that management intensive grazing where they use very high animals to create fairly high utilization levels. And what we find here from the beginning of the study through 2002, the least amount of cheat grass on this site was always found in the moderately grazed area. The most amount was found in the area that was re where cattle were removed and the high impact grazing area. So it's a bell curve. We have a lot of cheatgrass if there's no grazing. We have the least amount of cheatgrass where there's a moderate amount of well-managed grazing. And we have also a high amount of, of cheatgrass in the heavily grazed areas. Uh, the, in this case, the, what they call the high impact grazing. So um, what we know is that one of the reasons we might have a lot of different answers to the question, does grazing um, reduce cheatgrass, is because it can, or it, it can reduce cheatgrass, or it can expand and advance cheatgrass, just depending on the level of grazing. I want to point out one uh, interesting point about the study. If you notice in 2002, um, if all the bars sort of came together, and there wasn't very much cheatgrass, and then in 2003 and 4, the amount of cheatgrass in the high impact grazing study really increased, and that was because 2002 was a really dry year. And so what we learned from this is um, grazing can, we might really need to be careful with grazing right um, during those times of, of limited moisture or, or kind of drought conditions. Take home message, moderate grazing had the least cheatgrass, uh, even less than no grazing, moderately grazing also had less cheatgrass than heavy grazing levels, and that the high impact grazing caused the greatest increase in cheatgrass after a drought year. I'm going to point out this guide called the Green and Brown Guide. It's a guide to using grazing on invasive annual grasses. It's free. It's available at the ecologically, at the ecologically based integrated pest ma um, plant management website. Um, www.ebipm.org. They have a lot of good information about invasive plants, specifically invasive grasses, and this green and brown guide is a synthesis of what research exists on using grazing to manage invasive grasses.
here's my take home of all the stuff that I've read on how grazing affects annual grasses. No grazing, without grazing, you probably are going to have more cheatgrass. Uh, you've got to have at least some moderate levels of grazing to really reduce cheatgrass, and that's because cheatgrass and other annual grasses are very good forage early on um, in the spring. However, if you have grazing early in the spring, you could reduce grazing. Uh, you could reduce cheatgrass because animals are going to focus on that cheatgrass. At peak season, the time when the perennial grasses start to flower, then there's a potential that grazing will be switched or will, livestock will start to focus on those perennial grasses and that will give an advantage back to the cheatgrass. So during a peak season, especially heavy grazing, will probably um, cause an increase in cheatgrass. And then some really recent data out of Nevada shows that even grazing in the dormant season would, in, would decrease cheatgrass. Now I would have said no because most of my previous lectures um, have stated pretty emphatically that grazing in the dormant season is not damaging to plants. So why would it be damaging to cheatgrass? Why would there be less cheatgrass if it was grazed in the dormant season? We don't actually know the mechanism of, of this, but Barry uh, Perryman, the researcher who's working on this, says that he believes it's because um, when you have grazing you have less litter on the ground and that cheatgrass really does benefit from having a little litter on the ground surface to promote um, new seedling establishment. So who knows the exact mechanism? We might know in a few years, but this is my take-home message for how grazing influences um, the a a abundance of cheatgrass in particular and annual grasses in general. Let's go back to the first chart. Remember we talked about grazing as having potential influence on biomass, fuel amount, and continuity. Those are the three main ways that we can change the fuel characteristics with grazing. I want to focus now on weather. Talked already a little bit about wind speed and relative humidity. But if I put all that together, I just want to say that grazing can be used to manage fuels, but it really does, does depend on the, on the weather conditions and on the type of fuel. So on the, the y-axis, we have on the top upper left-hand part of the chart, we have an area of mostly herbaceous fuels, very few shrubs. And when you have low fire weather conditions, in other words, low wind, high um, moisture levels, high dead fuel moistures, um, then grazing can be quite effective in managing those fuel loads and reducing the extent of and severity of fires. However, as you move to more extreme fires, and if you move from a herbaceous to a shrub-dominated system, then the role of grazing is less and less valuable. So there's a decrease, decreasing effect of grazing to manage fuel loads. As you move into severe fire situations, fire weather situations, or as you move out of grasslands into shrubland situations. So it seems sort of logical, but uh, there is no one answer to the question of how does grazing stop or slow fires. It really depends on the fuel and the fire weather conditions. So here's what we know. Here's what I would say if I summarized everything I've just visited with you about in a few points. One, grazing can reduce fuels. We know that. Two, grazing will not stop wildfires under very hot and dry conditions. Uh, the levels that you'd have to reduce fuels to is just so low that it would be infeasible to do with uh, grazing. Finally, grazing can reduce cheatgrass and grazing can increase cheatgrass. It depends on the skill of the manager that's mostly based on the use of livestock and an understanding of the levels and, of, and season of grazing necessary to reduce cheatgrass. Finally, grazing can reduce fire line intensity and promote recovery after fire. And this fourth point, we don't know as much about it. The data seems to really be pointing in this direction that we can reduce fire intensity and that if we do that, we can promote recovery after the fire because we've killed less plants from the fire. But stay tuned. That's one we don't know much about. So those are some of the main impacts of grazing and fire. And the next topic we'll talk about how you could actually use, um, how you should be pay, pay attention to grazing after fire.